Hey everybody, welcome, happy Friday. It's my pleasure to be streaming to you live once again. My name is Terry White, Principal Director, Worldwide Photography Evangelist. Here at Adobe, it's my pleasure to be streaming to you live once again. Uh, so it's, it's my favorite day of the week, as I always say, not just because it's Friday and it's leading into the weekend, but more importantly, I get to do the thing I love so much, and that is uh, streaming to you guys live for uh, my photography masterclass. For those of you who are new, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. If you're watching on the replay, thanks for watching replays. I love replay views just as much as I love live views. And also, if you're watching this on other platforms, um, you could be watching this on my LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, um, Twitter, wherever you happen to be watching this. Thanks for popping in. Thanks for joining us. But just keep in mind that if you, um, if you want to participate in the chat, unfortunately, I won't be able to pay attention to all the various different chats. So the one chat that I will be paying attention to is this one right here at Adobe Live. So b.net slash Adobe Live is the one chat that I'll get a chance to, um, to, to get a chance to look at and take it, take advantage of and answer your questions. All right, hang on, I'm just removing a message here. Uh, let's just get rid of that. And also let's head over here. And so I like I see people on Facebook, uh, Kevin and and Kathleen and Cabo and Dale and and Stefan or Steven, welcome. And I see uh, people on the Behance chat, General Kenobi, um, Sean, and Jess and Jeffrey and everyone else there. I'm, I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time trying to pronounce everyone's names, but Candy, welcome everyone. And today we're going to be doing um, we, Fridays are, are master class Fridays where all the evangelists for Creative Cloud get to show their various disciplines. Um, you, we just uh, saw Paul Tranny doing Photoshop. I do photography. Then we have a we take a break for a, a daily creative challenge, which I believe is also going to be Photoshop. And then Paul's back doing graphic design, followed by. Um, Jason Levine doing audio and video, then uh, Howard doing UX UI design, and, and Kyle Webster doing digital painting and drawing, with some uh, daily creative challenges sprinkled in the middle of those, uh, so you have a full day of cool things to watch all day for all the different things you might want to do. Today, for the photography, photography masterclass that I'm doing right now, we're going to be doing portrait retouching, kind of a part two of what I did last week. So last week, for those of you who were here, great, glad you were here, good feedback. For those of you who missed it, it was 10 tips on just editing photos in general. Today, we're going to continue that process, but we're going to concentrate mostly on portraits. So this is going to be a whole portrait class where we're not going to be doing landscapes, not going to be doing street photography, not going to be doing uh, all the other stuff that I edit. We're just going to concentrate on, on portraits, which is what I concentrate on my photography most of the time anyway. So the portraits that I'll be editing, I think these are all, yeah, these are like last week I did a, uh, did some stock photos, showed you what I could do because I was looking for stock photos with, with particular problems that I could solve. This time it's all portrait retouching and these are photos that I've taken. So uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, I haven't taken a lot of new portraits. So hopefully I'm, I'm picking ones that you haven't seen that often or certainly haven't seen recently. And uh, we'll get into the various editing and, and techniques for that. All right. Um, all right. Here's a, here's a totally different off the like, just question. Terry, what's a good camera for shooting video and stills at the same time? If you mean by at the same time, meaning like I'm in a video shoot and I want to press a button and shoot stills, uh, I think most of the newer cameras can do that now. Certainly check that in the specs. And if you're just looking for a camera that also shoots video and stills, uh, there's, it's hard to go wrong with anything new. Like anything pr produced in the last couple of years is going to be a great camera for both video and stills. Um, Sony has been concentrating mostly on video. 
Um, Canon's been also concentrating a lot on video, but they also do traditional stills as well. And, and Nikon has, has basically been doing stills and they started video. So you can't go wrong with any one of these. Um, I would just say, you know, shop in your budget and look at the specs and look at the reviews. Uh, I don't have a real recommendation. Um, I use a Nikon Z6 II, um, shoots great video, shoots great stills, I'm happy. So if you want to use what I use, that's what I'm using. But it, again, you don't have to use what I'm using. Pretty much any new camera will do it. All right. Um, with that said, let's go ahead and dive into today's topic. I don't want to spend a lot of time chatting. Well, I can spend more time showing. So once again, before I take this away, if you want me to see your question, head over to b.net slash Adobe Live. Otherwise, we will um, come back at the end. And hopefully, I, I rarely have time for questions at the end, but I'll hopefully look at your questions while you're asking them. And uh, if there's any time at the end, I will answer any questions there as well. All right, so let's switch over to my desktop. In my desktop, I've got uh, Lightroom and Lightroom Classic running. Um, so I've got Lightroom. I've got Lightroom Classic. Um, I've got most of the same pictures in both, but uh, some, some are missing from the Lightroom album that are in this Lightroom Classic album. That's a different issue. <laughs> anyway, uh, so let's go back to when, uh, or, I'm reading somebody's comment, goes back to when dinosaurs were there. Okay, anyway, let's go back to what we're talking about today, which is editing portraits. So I have some male subjects, female subjects, um, because I, I tend to photograph uh, both, but mostly female subjects. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to do only female subjects for this. I, I will do both. So you get a chance to see what kind of techniques you should use for the different types of subjects. Um, pretty much it's the same. It's just, it just depends on, there's a few more things you might do with what I call softer subjects, females, babies, children. So things that are softer, softer skin is what I'm really referring to that you might do a little bit more to. But other than that, the, the techniques are pretty much the same, um, which is basically making the portrait look as good as it can without overdoing it, meaning don't over retouch to where it's obvious you did a retouch. It doesn't look like the person anymore. That's the biggest takeaway I can give you. And also um, just remember that um, it's not about your skills in Photoshop and how good you are at making things change. It's more about removing distractions, making the person look like they would look if they were standing right in front of you, and realizing that a uh, digital image is kind of unfair to all of us because it's freezing us in time, giving people a chance to look at every little nook and cranny that they normally would not notice. So just keep those kinds of things in mind. Now, when it comes to retouching and removing things like, um, pimples or, or hair or things like that away from a subject's face, I will, my rule of thumb for that is I'll remove it, if, especially if it's something temporary like a pimple, something that would be gone in two, two weeks. Uh, that's unfair to leave that in a portrait because you're freezing that portrait in time and that pimple is not frozen in time. But when it comes to things like moles and beauty marks and things like that that are permanent, I tend to leave those, even though I might have a technique or two to lessen their impact for the people that don't want them to be that impactful. Most people, if they're, especially if they're older and they have a mark, a beauty mark, a mole or whatever, it's part of their identity and they would be offended if you remove it. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and if you're ever in doubt, ask. So just remember to say, hey, is this something you're okay with me removing or not? Um, so just keep that in mind. All right. So let's go ahead and, um, I'm asking, uh, looking at here, is the stream blurry? It's set to 1080p. Uh, so some people are saying there's some image quality issues with the stream. I'm looking at it. It looks okay to me, but let me know. Very blurry. Oh no. Hang on. Let me see if I can fix that real quick. I, I'm at 1080p. I don't know what else I could do. But just let me remove this one little thing here. And let's see if this will take care of it. 
All right, let me know if that makes it better, worse, or no different, but um, that's about all I can do. <laughs> all right, uh, just got pixelated for a short bit ago. Video quality seems lower than usual over here at 1080p. All right, so sorry about that. Um, again, looks good on my end. I'm not sure what you're seeing, though. All right. Let me... Oh, yeah, okay, now I'm seeing it over on YouTube. I am seeing a, for whatever reason, a lower ish, low quality. Hmm. Because everything looks good except that YouTube window, which YouTube feeds, um, feeds the Behance stream. All right, guys, I, there's not anything I can do to it right now. Sorry about that. Um, hopefully the replay will be better. Uh, made it better. All right, so hopefully that someone said that made it better. I don't know. All right, so I'm going to move on because, again, there's uh, I can't do anything about it. <laughs> so I'm going to just go ahead and keep going. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and uh, dive right in. So, again, I've got this subject here, and I'll zoom in. Hopefully that will help you too because I'll zoom in to be both uh, – or <laughs> both on Adobe Live. Yep, I'll zoom in to hopefully alleviate any blurriness that you can can or can't see. All right, um, so with that said, for example, let's go ahead and take a look at this portrait. Now, I'm starting off in Lightroom or Lightroom Classic, which is where all my photos usually start. As I'm capturing them, they're captured into, um, into Lightroom Classic, and then I make any adjustments there that I can, and then I'll go ahead and go into Photoshop if I need to, if there's other things I need to do. Now, uh, actually, I want to pop over to, I want to do this one instead. All right, so this one, I'm going to head over to the develop to the develop module and in the develop module I'm going to go ahead and just make sure I hit reset so it's basically starting with the way it started in the camera. And so with that said, uh, some of the things that I normally do and normally look for right off the bat I'm looking at white balance and I can see like under his arm and up here in the upper left hand corner kind of see where under his arm it looks a little beige meaning that this is a white backdrop. There's a shadow here, but the, it's not so much that it's shadow, it's also that it is kind of like not the right color. So that lets me know there's a potential white balance issue. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the white balance eyedropper and just go ahead and click right into that shadow. And as you can see, the color did change. So let me go ahead and again zoom in so you can see the difference there. Let's pop over. Let's zoom out. Let's do it this way. I'll zoom into a very specific area. There we go. And so if I uh, undo that, you can now see that beige. And then when I click into it with the white balance eyedropper, you can kind of see it get to the right color. So that's right off the bat, just fixing the white balance in the photo. Next up, once I got per past that, because that was like distracting, couldn't do anything else. Now let's go ahead and um, switch it to a profile that I like to start off with, which is Adobe Portrait. Now, you're only going to get these profiles, color, landscape, portrait, standard, and vivid, if it's a raw file. If it's a JPEG, JPEGs don't have raw files. They don't have raw profiles, so you're not going to get the ability to change it. But if it's a if it's a raw file, I can change it to Adobe Portrait. doesn't do a whole lot visually. It just sets up all your edits going forward, letting Lightroom know it's a portrait, and kind of giving you that foundation of what um, the machine learning and all the things that Lightroom has been fed to look at a portrait and look like what a portrait's supposed to look like. All right. So with that said, now that that's happened, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, um, do my next thing that I always do is an auto tone because the auto tone, well, actually I'm, I take that back. The next thing I would do is not an auto tone. The next thing I would do before I even do the auto tone is go into my lens corrections. And if I did not shoot this with my mirrorless, which I did not, it looks like, I would enable the lens profile correction. And what that will do is, number one, you can kind of see some shadows in the, in the vignette area. That's lens vignetting. And you'll also see the image kind of move a little because what that's doing is kind of correcting that curvature that would be in the lens. It's kind of removing that for me. So just simply turning that on is kind of taking any curvature out of the person's face, out of their body, out of anything that the lens has added as a distortion. 
Now that I've gotten that done, now I'll head back up and I'll hit my auto and see if I like it. Because auto doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to like everything it does. It's just saying what it thinks it should do to the photo. It basically takes all the sliders under the basic uh, tone and, uh, and adjusts them. And I decide from that point whether or not I like those adjustments. So once again, here's the before. And look at what look at kind of what it's doing to um, his his his, uh, his highlights on his face and the color and and kind of the the shadow areas here. Just look when I go ahead and click auto, it kind of brightened things up a little bit, and that's okay. Um, I think it's a little too bright, so that's what I mean by I like to see what it does, and then I'll decide if I want to go from there. So for example, exposure it brought it up a quarter stop. I'm going to double click the exposure. Um, handle to put it back down to zero. So in other words, I don't want you to make this any brighter. So that's it. Like just go back down to where you were. Now, I don't mind it increasing the contrast. I don't mind it dropping the highlights. I don't mind it increasing the shadows. That might be a little too much. I might pull it down a little bit, but I don't mind that. And the uh, whites and blacks, it kind of moved just a little bit. I'm okay with that. Now, where I usually disagree also is down here in vibrance and saturation. Because on portraits, I usually don't use saturation. So, um, Terry, would you remove the tiny black piece on the bottom left corner? Um, I'm getting to that. So, Ozzy's asking me, would I remove that little tiny part of his sleeve in the lower left-hand corner? I haven't gotten that far yet. So, uh, we'll see in a minute. All right. So, the next thing I'm going to do is, um, so I was back to vibrance and saturation. Vibrance, I absolutely love on portraits. Saturation, absolutely do not. Because saturation unfortunately on a portrait will also affect skin tone so to make the skin you know it'll, it'll drastically affect the color of the skin and i don't want that on a person so i usually go ahead and reset the saturation back down to zero now I did, it was only a little bit of an adjustment but it doesn't need it so why have it at all take it off now vibrance is okay because it does not drastically affect the skin tone doesn't shouldn't shouldn't affect the skin tone at all unless you overdo it so where vibrance will come in is it will make the flower and the, the handkerchief and the shirt more vibrant. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. But if I were to take it back down, look at those things I just pointed out. And it didn't adjust them that much. So it was only a little bit of an adjustment. But if I crank it up, you can kind of see what it's doing. And if I go too far, yeah, it's making the skin orange. But I would never take it up to 100 anyway. So it's just a slight adjustment in vibrance. Now, just to show you the difference. If I were to even take saturation up just a little, his skin starts to turn orange immediately. So saturation is not your friend when it comes to portraits, unless you do it selectively. Like if you do saturation only on the parts you want with an adjustment brush or with a new masking, perfect. But just make sure you don't do it on skin. All right, so now that we got that, and let's go ahead and crank the uh, vibrance back up just a bit to get those things that I want more vibrant, more vibrant. Um, and lastly, you notice that there's a highlight warning here in the shadow areas, and there could also be one in, this is clipping, there could also be one in, or this is highlight clipping, and the shadows being um, uh, un underexposed, meaning that everything that's turning blue when I, highlight, when I hover over this triangle is completely solid black. There's no more data left in that space. If it was a warning over here, everything would turn red, that I highlight over, and that means it's completely white. There's no more data left in that area. Now, if the area that it's turning completely solid black or completely solid white in is not important, like under his jacket is not important to me, then I don't care. But if it were important, um, Terry, the stream is so blurry, rallying through you too. Okay. Uh, I will keep going. I, I will try and zoom in more to so, so you can see it. But anyway, if I were, um, if if that part were important, then I would take the slider and I would move it over just a little bit so that, and basically what I mean by that, and here I'll zoom in so you can see. What I mean by that is when you're on this triangle, it turns into a finger, but when you move down below it, it actually turns these into sliders for each area. So here's the, the blacks, shadows, exposure, highlights, and whites. So if I were to move the 
um, blacks over a little bit to where that triangle turns gray or turns off, then I've corrected the problem. So therefore, now if I hover over it, it's no longer turning blue down here under his jacket. So again, that wasn't an area I cared about. I probably would have left it. I probably wouldn't have cared that it was turning that solid black, but fixing it also doesn't really make a big difference either because in this case, um, it wasn't. It was only affecting that one area. All right. So now the question is, are you done? You've kind of made some corrections in Lightroom. You kind of, you know, and you could always continue to do more corrections, but are you, um, are you okay with where you're at? In other words, do you see anything else that you would want to adjust? And someone pointed out like his hand is, is coming back into the frame down here at the bottom. So, and, and this one little area down here. So do I want that? Probably not um, because it's, it's not enough of it to be, make a difference and it's more of a distraction. But then I got some other issues too. So the question now is, do I bother trying to fix those things here in Lightroom or do I head to Photoshop? Because for example, uh, one of the things I don't like is, is the bottom of his little um, button here or, pin, or flower. The pin is sticking out, so that's a distraction for me. I don't like the way his collar is kind of pushed up in the back here. Um, so there's, uh, I don't like the highlights on his, his forehead. That's just my lighting issue there that I'm, I'm not liking how bright those areas are. So once I start seeing those kinds of things, then I would probably say it's time to head to Photoshop because while I could try and start fixing that stuff in Lightroom, it's just going to take me more time and just not be worth it. So in that case, I'm going to head over to, um, head over to Photoshop and work on the things that would be easier and faster for me to do. So now to do that, I, I want to keep all the things I've done in Lightroom so far, but I just want to head to Photoshop to, with a copy of this image to do the rest. Now I say copy because it is a, it is a raw file. It is a DNG. So therefore, um, if I bring it over to Photoshop, it will come over as a copy anyway. So here, how do I make a copy? I hit, hit Command E on Mac, Control E on Windows, or I could just right click and choose, um, yeah, there we go. I could right click and choose Edit in Photoshop. So either way, it's just gonna automatically make a copy in Photoshop without um, bringing over the original. So what that means is uh, a lot of people will say, hey, shouldn't I now cre instantly create a duplicate layer so that if I mess up, I can go back to that original? I don't do that because this is my original. This is the original I already have. That's not going to ever change. So, but if you, if that, you're that person, yeah, you can go ahead and duplicate the layer. There we go. I just made you feel better. <laughs> so I always make that joke because people get really offended if you don't make that duplicate layer first. I don't make the duplicate layer because I don't have to. But anyway, you, you can choose whether you want to make it or not. So now I can really get in and do the kinds of things that, that, are, that are bothering me that would be harder to fix in Lightroom. So for example, um, let's go ahead and just the one thing I can't stop looking at is that little pin sticking through his jacket. So we're just going to quickly grab the, um, the spot, uh, spot healing brush. And I am working with a, here I'll show it to you. I'm working with a Cintiq. So I've got um, my, I'm doing this right on screen and I will just go ahead and remove that. All of that little um, distraction there really quickly, really easy. All right, so with that said, next up, and, and now that I'm here, I, I see some other things. I see like whatever this little mark is here. So these are, again, these are kind of nitpicky things. And these are the kind of nitpicky things that will bug me now that I've seen them, I can't unsee them. So I'm just gonna use the spot healing brush and continue to remove those kinds of things. Now, um, like we all know that that little white piece is, that's the, that's the thread from the back of the button, but do we really need to see it anymore? Nope, we don't, so why not get rid of it? We know what it is, it's supposed to be there, it's part of the shirt, but uh, that doesn't mean we have to look at it anymore. So. You can go through and spend time getting rid of all those little things I mentioned, all the little things that might bother you in the clothing area of the of the of the shot. 
But now let's get down to the one thing that someone already brought up. And like I said, I would get to it in a minute. Now's that minute. Uh, zoom in down here and take care of uh, this one little, his, his hand is coming back into the frame and I just don't want to see it anymore because it's not enough of his hand. So in this case, I'm going to grab my uh, patch tool and just make a selection, make a better selection around that. There we go. And now, so some tips with working with the patch tool. The, the reason I like the patch tool, because unlike any other tool, you get a preview before you commit to using that tool. So now we're just gonna go ahead and just pull this up and I get a preview of what it would look like. So if I drag it over here, that's what it's gonna look like. If I drag it over here, that's what it's gonna look like. And I, I, if I'm on an edge, the tip I'm gonna give you is instead of dragging it to the middle of the, of the empty space here, keep it on the edge. Because if you keep it on the edge, that will most likely blend the edge in properly. If you don't keep it on the edge, then your results could be okay or they could be sporadic. In this case, it was okay. But if you get that kind of blurriness after you do it, it's because you drug it into an area and it couldn't figure out that that was still an edge, so it didn't know what to do. Or you're on normal instead of content aware. So if you want it to be an exact copy, choose content aware. If you want it to kind of blend in, use normal. So I usually switch back and forth between them depending on what I want. All right, so that takes care of that little distraction now. So now his arm is completely out of the frame, not just a little bit of a sleeve coming in. And the same kind of thing going on over here. There's this little bitty white space from his jacket over here that's, we know what it is, but it's kind of a distraction because what's that little white piece peeking through? So this is the kind of stuff that, uh, again, like I said, doesn't matter male, female, or other that we would still kind of do because um, we just want them to, you know, to not have that distraction and not look like, hey, what's that? Because we don't want people saying, hey, what's that? When they shouldn't be saying, hey, what's that? <laughs> All right. Okay, so now, next up, speaking of clothes, like I said, I don't like the way his collar's pushed up. His, his collar's pushed up because of the way he's posing, not because of the way his jacket doesn't fit. So in that case, that's kind of like, well, why should, we, why should we have this little hump here or this little lump here if we don't need it? So let's go ahead and take care of that little hump. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and switch over to uh, my healing. Okay, so before I do this, one thing you might do whenever you're going to run a, a filter, and I'm going to run the liquify filter. One thing you might do before you run any filter is you might go into the filter menu and come down to um, convert for smart filters. So when you do a convert for smart filters, what that will do is that will tell it that we want the um, we want the layer to be converted into a smart object so that it is non-destructive from this point forward. So that way. Um, <laughs> that way i'm just reading more of the comments here sorry about the blurriness you guys are experiencing but uh that, that was a funny comment anyway um before we convert for before we do this converting for smart filters converts the layer into a smart object so that it will be the filter you're applying is non-destructive so if i do that and then i uh, now run liquify filter uh liquify Whatever I do in the liquify filter, good or bad, will be undoable from here on out because, again, I've converted to a smart object first. So let me go ahead and zoom in because, again, some people are having some quality issues here. So zoom into that area really nice and big there so you can see it. I'm going to zoom out just a little. There we go. And now um, we're going to use the first tool here, which is the forward warp tool. And the biggest advice I give you with the Fort Warp tool is just to make sure that you are on a, um, you are on a brush that's the size of whatever it is you're trying to push. So for example, if I want to push his, this, this bulge down, then having this really tiny brush is going to really just do me a disservice because I'm going to have to do a whole bunch of pushing to get that all even. And it's just gonna look bad when you're done. It's, it's rarely that you're gonna use a little brush to move something big and it's gonna look good. 
So I'm going to go ahead and undo that and make my brush nice and big to kind of comp or complement whatever it is I'm trying to push. Now, the other thing that you want to tend to do when you're using this tool is you want to make sure that um, when you're going to push something, you're you're not pushing, you're not starting from out here in the background. You're actually taking some of the, the clothing or whatever it is with you. So it'll look more natural because if you start out here and push into it, if you look closely, it will look, um, it will look blurrier um, around the edges when you do it. If you take it with you and do it like this, then it will certainly look a lot less blurry when you do it. So now I'm going to get close to his ear. So I don't want to accidentally pull his ear in. So in this case, I will have to make my brush a little smaller, but that's okay. I'm moving a smaller object now. And same thing, we're going to make our brush a little smaller to not pull his ear down. And you might need to even get smaller yet. Now, how can I do this? Let's say I really had to get into this corner and do it without pulling down his ear. Well, I've showed you this technique before, but there is a tool called the, or not push left, there is a tool called the freeze mask tool. The freeze mask tool is designed for you to mask anything you don't want to move. So if I just paint over his ear or any part of the ear that I may touch first, now when I go back to my uh, warp tool, it doesn't matter if I'm touching his ear. Here, I can even make a bigger brush because his ear will not be pull, pulled down because it's been masked off. So if you're close to something that you don't want to get affected, go ahead and take a few seconds and mask it first and then you won't have to ever worry about pulling that area down because you masked it first. And, and even though you see that red, it's obviously not gonna be permanent on the image once you get out of this. All right, so now that we've done that, um, then I might look for other things, like for example, where his jacket has a natural bend here. Uh, let's zoom into this area. And uh, I might go with the warp tool. I might make the brush a little smaller. I might go the other way. I might just take that bend out of the sleeve so that we don't see it um, look, make it look distracting. So you can fix all kinds of wrinkles and things like that, really smooth out the collars, really smooth out things that you don't want to look distracting that don't have to be. Now this looks like it might be his pocket sticking off the side of the jacket there. So same thing, while we're at it, we can zoom in, grab the warp tool, make a nice big brush, and just kind of start pushing all that in. Like so. And make our brush a little smaller and pull that back out. All right, bigger brush. Okay. Zoom out. There we go. See, now it's, look at that jacket. It's really starting to shape up. And while we're at it, got a little piece sticking out there. Let's go ahead and push that in. And if I was going to really get nitpicky, I might even start straightening out some of these wrinkles. But you get the idea. So we just basically got the major things that I wanted fixed in the jacket. Hang on. Hold on. Just noticing that we can even push that out further. There we go. And away we go. Um... Click OK, and that will apply it. And again, because we did it as a smart filter layer, it will allow us to go in and undo it, redo it, and see what it looks like before and after, because uh, we can always turn that on or off to get back to the original. OK. Next thing we're going to do is um, take a look at some of these. Uh, again, the only thing that's bothering me now is kind of like these highlights in his forehead, these highlights under his eyes. They're, they're just from the light, I can see that there's a hot spot there. And um, I might do this a couple different ways. So I could, because what I want to do is I'm not going to be able to do it while it's a smart object, unless I go back into the original and do it anyway, which defeats kind of the purpose of a smart object. So I might just um, take what we have so far and command option, PC control, alt, shift E, 
and that will take everything you've done so far and put it on its own new layer. So basically you still have your safety layers to go back to, but now you have this new layer which you can go in and do whatever you want to. It's already got all the adjustments made to the with the liquify and now we can just get into it and continue working. All right, so next thing I want to do is I want to zoom in so you guys can see it better. And now that I'm zoomed in, um, now he's the, the the other challenge is he's got freckles or these spots. <laughs> I'm going to call them freckles. Uh, you you've got um, you've got some good area over here that doesn't have the highlight problem, which is good because if you didn't have that, then it would be harder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my clone stamp tool, hit the letter S. Go to my clone stamp tool and clone stamp has modes. So I'm going to switch my mode to darken. There we go. And I'm also going to set my opacity because I don't want it to be 100% strength. I'm going to set my opacity down to 40%. So I like to start there. So darken, clone stamp, soft brush, 40%. So those of you who can't see that, there we go. So clone stamp, soften, darken, 40% opacity, and we'll go from there. All right, so now that I've got that, the next thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and uh, just go ahead and make my brush nice and big. So I'm using the right bracket key to do that. And I'm going to hold down my Option or Alt key and click this area that doesn't have the highlight problem. So now I'm going to come over to the area that does have the highlight problem and just click. And just click. And just click. And each time I'm clicking, I'm applying that 40% of it. So that's why it's not going away all in one fatal swoop. It's only getting 40% of it. So I'm lessening it a little at a time. You might well say, well, why don't you just do 100? Because 100 might be too much. And it starts to get really foggy or, or, or noticeable that you did it at 100%. That way you can build it up a little at a time until it's completely gone. Now, the other problem is when you do it this way is that um, it doesn't look the same. And that, that might be okay because there are different parts of our face that don't look the same as other parts of our face. But if you kind of want that same texture look to be over here now that it's been done, you can then switch over to your patch tool and you can maybe go grab like part of that area you did and come over here and make sure you're on normal, not... Um, not content aware, and then you can start to patch it so that you're kind of blending back in that same uh, look to a skin and you don't want to, anything to repeat. So just remember, you don't want it to look like you did it. So that way you kind of end up with that same look. Now, again, everyone's face is going to be different. Some of this you can get away with, some of this you can't. So it just depends. All right. Next up, uh, would frequency separation remove the highlight as well? No. Well, not the way I use frequency separation. So I've had a couple of frequency separation questions. We're going to get to it. But frequency separation is more of a of a um, softening technique than a removal technique. So it's not going to really remove it. It would just soften it. It might remove some of it, but probably not enough. All right. Um, let's go. So same kind of thing down here. I could try the clone stamp. I could try the patch, whichever one I think might work better. I think I'm going to start with patch in this case and just pull down a little bit and just continue to work on it and continue to blend in those edges. And then I can go and work on the little details. And I'm rushing through this because, of course, I'm, I'm limited on time. But you would take your time and make sure you get every little area the way you want it. And then now we're, you know, we're left with, I don't mind so much the bridge like this, this part. I do mind the little spot on the bottom, though, the little circle. If you do mind the bridge, you've got a good part of nose that doesn't have it. So just take your time. And I'm trying to, again, I'm doing this quickly in one fatal swoop. You might do it a small pieces at a time to make it look more natural. There we go. All right. And if we zoom back out, I like it. Now, the only thing I'm not liking is because we took away, we took so much of that highlight away, 
his forehead actually got darker. Because remember that, that that part of his face was lit with the light. So we don't want to make that look so much like it's almost gone, gone. So that's why, again, that's why you do the 40% because maybe you don't want to remove it all. Um, and that, in this case, I removed it all, so I removed too much of it. So I'm going to switch over to my uh, dodge tool and just add a little bit of highlight back in. Not that much. <laughs> just add a little bit back in. There we go. Kind of Because, again, that part was lit for a reason. All right, that's better. There we go. So when I zoom out, because this is the way people are going to be looking at it, they're not going to really hold their phone up to their face like this to their eyeball. They're going to be looking at it the way it normally looks. So you kind of want to, this is your check to zoom out to a fit and window size or 100% size to see what it looks like because zoomed in is not going to be what people are mostly looking at. All right, so now we got some, uh, just some personal things down here at the bottom on his neck. When I say personal, I mean my personal pet peeves. Uh, I, I just, uh, necklines and things like that don't do me any favors. Uh, everyone has them. So it's not like, oh, this person's weird because they have these lines. We all have, the, oh, we all have these lines. We all have these marks. So I tend to want to, hang on for a second. There we go. I tend to want to get rid of them because it's just me. I've always had a pet peeve. I've told you this for years with these lines. So again, this is just a Terry White thing. This is not a you have to do it thing. Oh. What's going on? There we go. My my refresh is not. There we go. So again, just removing some of that. That bothers me. All right, so that's kind of one of those things I would continue to work on until I got it the way I want it, but just letting you guys know. So then I see a little, like, this little spot on his lip down here. Let's go ahead and take that off. A little spot on his nose or a little pimple there. All right, next up. Eyes are very important. Now, um, redness in the eyes, um, you, you know use it reduce at your own discretion because we all have redness in our eyes no matter how much sleep you get so like his eyes aren't bad to me like he's got a couple little marks here and there but there's nothing out of nothing that's driving me crazy nothing is going overboard but i do like my eyes to be sharper so i will go ahead and grab the sharpen tool um the sharpen tool has gotten much better in photoshop over the years make my brush a little bigger and i'm just going to go ahead and with pressure sensitivity just go ahead and just um, sharpen those eyes up a little bit. It may not look like you did much, but trust me. Um, here, I'll show you the before and after. Before, after. Before, after. So you can really start to see uh, the catch lights and those just pupils really stand out when you use the sharpen tool on the eyes. So I would use the sharpen tool on eyes, jewelry, gold, anything that's like around the subject that I really want to stand out. And that's pretty much it. Like I could keep going, I could always keep going on this photo, but then we won't ever get to the other photo. So I would, I could do more, but that's kind of where I would go with this portrait. So again, uh, for those of you who are like saying, well, how, how far did you go? What did you end up with? This is where we started, that's the before. And so I'll zoom in, um, I showed you the overall before, the overall after, now we'll zoom in. Now we'll zoom in. There we go. And that's our before. And that's our after. So again, just toning down those highlights. I probably took the highlights off a little too much. But just toning those highlights down. And um, just getting rid of any distractions. So like all the distractions in the jacket. Um, gotten, gotten rid of most of those and just made everything cleaner. Now I could start, you know, really being nitpicky and cleaning out all these little wrinkles, every little thing. But again, that's up to you and your time. Uh, all right. So with that said, let's go ahead and save it. So now that's saving a layered new, brand new PSD. And because we came from Lightroom or Lightroom Classic, it will save that layered PSD 
um, back to the original place where the file was. So in other words, it'll save it back to the Lightroom collection, the Lightroom folder, the Lightroom cloud, whatever, wherever you got this from in Lightroom, it's going to put this PSD right next to the original, right back in the same spot. So I see it's still saving behind me. There's a progress bar going on behind me there. And we'll let that progress bar finish. We don't have to, but I'm going to let it finish so you can see the before, or not the before and after, but where it puts it. Now, um, that's another thing too. So just remember that when you edit from Lightroom into Photoshop, it's important if you want the photo to go back to the original spot, that you don't change the location, like move stuff around in Lightroom while you're editing in Photoshop. In other words, like I, while, I, while I have this photo open, I don't want to go back to Lightroom and start moving the collection around or changing things in the collection or moving my view to a different collection because that's how it ends up not coming back to the same spot is when you go back to Lightroom while the image is open and you do something else. All right, it's almost done. It's a big file with lots of layers or a few couple layers. shouldn't say lots of layers. A couple layers, but it's a big file. It's a raw file and it is almost done. And tell you what, I'll give it a few more seconds because it's like running low on time. 97%. I love it when it gets to 97% and just stays there. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so Jeffrey says they look edited already. Um, no, I, I showed you, I hit reset on it to let you know this is the way it was directly out of the camera. I didn't, uh, this had not been edited at all. Um, Sheila over on Facebook is asking, what about the spot healing brush or the filter blur surface blur option? Okay. <laughs> like what about them? Yes, you could use those as well. All right. So it's done. I'm going to close it. Uh, head back over to Lightroom Classic. And like I said, it puts the original right next to, or puts the new one right next to the original. So that's why I said I don't ever worry about duplicating the layer because I always got the original to go back to. But if we were to go full screen, there's the before, the original, and here's the after. Um, just again, a couple quick edits. All right, so now let's continue on. Let's go on to this portrait here, these portraits. So these were all taken at the same time. I'm going to hit the develop module, hit the letter D, so that I can do a lot of the same corrections at the same time as long as my sync is set to auto sync. So in the bottom left hand, bottom right hand corner here, make sure your sync is set to auto sync. And that way, whatever you do to the one photo you've got selected will happen to all the other photos you've got selected. All right, so his eyes look edited already. I don't know what to tell you, dude. <laughs> that, that was a raw file directly out of the camera. I didn't touch anything. I showed you opening the DNG. All right, so anyway, uh, let's go ahead and click on uh, fix the white balance, which we just did. And we can go ahead and switch this to portrait. And let's go ahead and hit auto. And there we are. And that's a good, nice auto tone. Again, let's get rid of the saturation. I don't mind the increase in exposure. And I will fix whatever shadow issues we had. And so now if we go to each photo, that adjustment has happened to each one. So it wasn't just the one. It was all three at the same time. Okay, so now that I got all three um, adjusted from from a Lightroom standpoint, let's say that I want to now go into, I could leave them all selected or I can go into any individual one and edit in Photoshop like I just did. Now, um, I'm just trying to decide if I wanna edit this one or this one, because I think I have more to show you in this one. All right, I'm gonna go to this one. I got more things to show in this one and plus people are asking about frequency separation. So let me go ahead and do that one here because uh, this one is a prime candidate for it. All right, so let's do portrait, auto tone, and I am going to bring up the exposure just a bit. And we're going to do our camera calibration because I can see the vignetting. There we go. Beautiful. And now let's go ahead and command E, control E on Windows, uh, edit in Photoshop, which brings over a copy. And just for the sake of the people that like to have another copy, there's another copy. All right, so now, uh, a couple things real quick when it, when you have shadows under the eyes like this, which is usually, again, people like to always say, oh, you didn't get enough sleep, but it's also, um, 
just kind of a just a lighting issue <laughs> because it's lighting when you're lighting down from someone it's going to create shadows under here just like my lights creating shadows under here so therefore it's going to create shadows under the eyes as well under the eye sockets but if you want to reduce that i'm just going to show you a technique that i've always loved to do that where we completely get rid of it and then we bring some of it back so i'm going to grab that patch tool and just i'm going to just do it to one eye because i only have time to do it to one uh, there we go. So we completely get rid of it, making it look unnatural. But now that before you do anything else, before you deselect, before you make any other changes, while that patch is still selected, you can now go up to edit and choose fade patch selection or shift command F, shift control F on Windows. Now you get an undo on a slider. So you can say, I'm going to bring some of that back so it doesn't look so unnatural. This is all of it back. I can bring back as much of it as I want. So I'm basically using this technique whenever I want to have something in the portrait that belongs there, but reduce it. So I can say reduce it by 50%, and there's our 50% um, reduction, there's the before, and there's the after. So again, we didn't make it look so unnatural, completely get rid of it, we just lessened it using the fade patch. All right, so now, uh, before we run out of time, let's do this frequency separation thing. So. Frequency separation is a skin smoothing technique. There's lots of skin smoothing techniques. This is just one of them. Uh, so I'm going to show you the way that I've learned to do it. So we're going to uh, hit Command-J, which is duplicate the layer. Hit Command-J again, duplicate the layer. So now I've got, and again, we're turning this one off because that's our safety layer. So now I've got, uh, we're, we'll call this one layer one. And we'll call this one, which would normally be layer one copy. Okay, so now you've got, and you got the original, layer one, layer one copy. So we go to layer one, the, the sandwiched in between layer. And on that layer, we're going to um, blur it, filter, blur, Gaussian blur. And we're only blur it by like six pixels. And again, all of these numbers I'm giving will only, they only uh, are relevant depending on the resolution of your file. So these are for DNG files that are like 16 megapixels, 24 megapixels, so forth and so on. If you've got a low, low res file, then these numbers may be too high. If you've got a super high res file, these numbers may be too low. So you might have to adjust accordingly. Now, when I did that 6% blur on Gaussian, you don't see anything because I did it to the middle layer. If I turn off the top layer, there it is, you can see it. All right, so now with the middle layer um, selected, let me see, I'm, I'm actually gonna go, to, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to the top layer and I'm going to do an apply image. So image menu, apply image. And I want to do it to the layer that's in the middle. So layer one. I want it on RGB. I want the blending mode to be subtract. I want scale to be two. And I want the offset to be 128. And the way you'll know it looks right is you have this layer that looks like it's kind of like a, a pencil drawing of just the features. You don't really see anything else. And that's the way you know you've got this set up right. So now I'll click OK. And um, we're going to set the blend mode of that layer, which looks weird now. We're going to set the blend mode to linear uh, light. So now you don't really see it. It just basically it is applying like a uh, kind of a, this is going to be used for our pores and our, our skin to make it look more natural. So it's that layer that's kind of invisible that's there that you really don't see. Now we're going to go back to the middle layer. And this is where you would then go in and decide what areas of your photo need this um, need this softening. So, for example, I'm just going to give you this other eye. So, let's say we did it we did it over here. I'm going to go ahead and grab my lasso, and I'm just going to grab a nice big area of skin that I want to be affected by the softening. So, now that I've done that, I'm going to feather that selection. So, let's go to um, Select, modify, feather. We're gonna feather it by like 15 pixels. Again, the number will depend on the resolution of your photo. So 15 pixel feather just softens that selection. And now that we've softened the selection, we're gonna go ahead and blur that selection with Gaussian blur one more time. And we're gonna blur it this time much higher. I think I'm gonna use like 24. All right, now it's a, it's a subtle change because you've got that sharpening layer on top. But basically what you end up with is smoother skin that still has texture, still has pores. So if I were to turn this off, that's what we had before. If I were to turn this on,
that's what we have now. So if I want it um, less sharpening, then I can go to that sharpening layer and I can kind of turn it down a little bit. Not that much. <laughs> turn it down a little bit. And that will reduce the amount of the sharpness of the pores. But basically, that's a professional technique that people use that do professional retouching so that the skin gets softer, but the pores are still there. It looks more natural when you do it. All right, so that's called frequency separation, and you can also make an action for it. So you don't have to remember every single step. You make an action that even pauses so you can put the numbers in for um, the blurs and for the, um, for the apply image so you can get it just right. All right. And that is my time, unfortunately. Um, there would be other things I would do, like I would fix the stray hairs, either clone those out or patch those out. Um, I would definitely fix the other eye there and kind of soften that up a little bit. And maybe I would even reduce this one a little bit more because now that I'm zoomed out, which is where I would normally see it, it still looks a little blurrier than it should. All right, so speaking of blurry, sorry about folks on YouTube and Behance that may have had a blurry experience today. We'll make sure that that doesn't happen again. All right, so with that said, cheers, everyone. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next week when we're going to be doing um, mobile. We're going to be doing what's new in Lightroom and Photoshop for mobile devices. Cheers, everyone. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye, everybody.